section and just take a look, if you will, because we're in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 starts out, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. Wow. Who could have thought, Pastor Scott, that we could have uh, scheduled that on July 4th? <laughs> it was. And uh, I'd just like to take a look at uh, some of the things that brought us up. Let me just read a couple of things here about freedom uh, for our nation. It says, uh, during the uh, revolution, 18 of the signers were under 40. Three were in their 20s. Of the 56, almost half, 24, were judges and lawyers. 11 were merchants, 9 were landowners and farmers, and the remaining 12 were doctors, ministers, and politicians. With only a few exceptions, such as Samuel Adams of Massachusetts, there were men of substantial poverty, of property. All but two had families. The vast majority were men of education and standing in their communities. They had economic security as few men had in the 18th century. Each had more to lose from the revolution than he had to gain by it. John Hancock, one of the richest men in America, already had a price of 500 pounds on his head. He signed an enormous letter so that His Majesty could now read his name without glasses and could now double the reward on his head. Ben Franklin Riley noted, indeed, we must all hang together, otherwise we shall most assuredly hang separately. Fat Benjamin Harrison of Virginia told tiny Eldridge Jerry of Massachusetts, and I love this part, <laughs> I've seen this numerous times, with me, it will be all over in a few minutes when we are hung. But you, you will be dancing in the air an hour after I'm gone. <laughs> Francis Lewis, I'll just mention a couple of them. Uh, Francis Lewis saw his home plundered and his estates in what is now Harlem completely destroyed. Mrs. Lewis was captured and treated with brutality. Although she was later exchanged for two British prisoners through the efforts of Congress, she died from the effects of her abuse. William Floyd was able to escape with his wife and children across the Long Island Sound to Connecticut, where they lived as refugees without income for seven years. When they, came, when they came home, they found a devastated ruin. Uh, John Hart of Trenton, New Jersey, risked his life to return home to see his dying wife. Hessian soldiers dro drove him away, dro rode after him, and he escaped into the woods. While his wife lay on her deathbed, the soldiers ruined his farm and wrecked his homestead. When able to sneak home, he found his wife had already been buried and his 13 children were taken away. He never saw them again. He died a broken man in 1779 without ever finding his family. And then lastly, I'll read Robert Morris, merchant prince of uh, Philadelphia, met Washington's appeals and pleas for money year after year. Our town is named after this man. He, went, uh, he made and raised arms and provisions which made it possible for Washington to cross the Delaware at Trenton. In the process, he lost 150 ships at sea, bleeding his own fortune and credit almost dry. He spent many years in debtor's prison. Lives, fortunes, honor of those 56 who signed the Declaration of Independence Nine died of wounds and hardships during the war. Five were captured in prisons, in each case with brutal treatment. Several lost their wives, sons, and entire families. One lost his 13 children, two wives were brutally treated, 12 signers had their homes completely burned, 17 lost everything they owned, yet not one defe defected or went back on his pledged word. Their honor and the nation they sacrificed so much to create is still intact. There's a great deal of sacrifice, and that's what takes place, that's what happens when we want freedom. Freedom is such that is, uh, comes at a great price, and our freedom came at the price of Christ, Jesus Christ's life. And today as we think of freedom, and as this section opens up on freedom, uh, this is just a human example of what uh, takes place for freedom, and you can just imagine on God's level what it took for him to give his only son for us. This morning as we go through this, uh, this, through this, we're talking a lot about legalism. We talked about legalism last week and uh, the fact that uh, legalism and uh, following the law is taking us backwards and retreating. And I like this, uh, like this quote from Wilson. It says, legalism is treating that which is good as if it were essential. Legalism is treating that which is good as if it were essential. This morning our verses are, we only have a few verses. Uh, if I could have the next slide here, let's uh, just... Uh, Let's uh, all stand and just read the three verses we're going to look at today as we've been accustomed to do it. And let's all read it together in uh, no response of reading. Uh, read it with me if you would. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole love is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, Take care that you are not consumed by one another. May the Lord have his blessing to the reading of his word, and you may be seated. 
Uh, what I'd like to do for the first couple of seconds here of this sermon is just go over what we talked about last week because it's really a part one and part two. And as you look at the whole thing, you get an, an impression of what, we, um, of what the whole aspect of uh, this chapter is talking about. Uh, it started off with a contrast of two options. One was choosing the law or choosing faith, if you remember last week. And you can just run through these slides if you would for me as we uh, go through this. Um, the contrast of the two options was in verse one. Then in verses two through four, they talked about the consequences of uh, choosing the law. And there were four consequences. First, Christ was of no benefit. Second, you become obligated to the whole law, not just the one, because if you're gonna take one, you have to take the whole thing. You're severed from Christ and you're fallen from grace. These are the consequences of choosing the law. The results of choosing faith are the opposite. It's the indwelling spirit, it's having the blessed hope, and faith working through love. So here we already have, you see a hope, faith, and love, all three, again, working through this particular section as we look at verses, um, we look at verses uh, five and six. Then in verses seven through 12, he contrasts the Judaizers, and he talks about the Judaizers who are come and trying to get in the retreat into law. And so under the, under the Judaizers, he says there's six things that they do, and this is what they are. They hinder the truth, they're not from God, they contaminate the church, which is, what, uh, which is what often happens is you have, the church breaks up with different doctrinal problems on ours. They will be judged. They persecute true teachers, and we can even see that happening today as, as those who speak the truth sometimes are uh, even having their cut off, heads cut off and stuff from some places of the world. And these Judaizers who are trying to get us to retreat from our um, grace in Jesus Christ, he said they should be cut off. And if you remember, that was an interesting section because he said they were trying to get people to be circumcised, and he said they ought to just go ahead and castrate themselves all the way, you know, just uh, get cut off because he, they were just such a uh, contaminated to what he was trying to teach of the word of God because we cannot come to Jesus Christ through the law because keeping the law does not make us part of God. We cannot, in fact, keep the law. The law was given to represent the fact that we are not able to be uh, saved by the law but only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Christ. Now the flip side, after he talks about the Judaizers, is what we're going to talk about today. And there's only three verses here, and there's four things we're going to learn this morning as we look at this particular section in verses 13 through 15. So join me, if you will, here um, as we look at this. Perhaps you remember the uh, song, Oh, 4,000 Tongues to Sing, okay? Uh, in it, John, uh, Charles Wesley has these words, he breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the prisoner free. And that's today we're looking for. When you, when you want to follow the law, you're a slave to the law. When you accept what Jesus Christ has done for us, then you become free in Jesus Christ. Now, what does that freedom mean? Some people don't understand that. Some people take freedom and think it means they can do anything they want, and that's fine. And we call that license, if you remember, uh, rather than liberty. And so we don't want to have license, we want liberty or freedom. And there's four things that, Jesus, that Paul wants to tell us in this particular section as we look over. The first is that, as the characteristic of the Christian, is that we have the opportunity to oppose the flesh. It's always a battle. When we come to Jesus Christ, our old desires are still there. Our old nature is still there. It, it, is, it is, um, is being conquered by the Spirit in our lives. As you noticed, we get the Spirit. It said that, and that's one of the results of, of uh, having faith, is having the Spirit. That helps us do the right thing, but we still have that tendency and that draw toward doing the wrong thing. And so oftentimes when we have this uh, option, we choose the wrong thing. Opportunity here is, um, is really a military term. It's like a, a central base of operations. It's when you're in an operations and you have the opportunity to go one way or the other. Uh, it's the opportunity to win a military campaign. And the military campaign in our lives that's, how, that's waging is, are we gonna obey the law or Satan or in this case, the flesh, or are we gonna obey the spirit and do what God wants us to do? These two opposing forces are fighting in our lives, and as Christians, one of our characteristics is to oppose the flesh in our lives. What is the flesh? Well, it's the old nature, the carnal man, that kind of thing. In 1 Peter 3.18, um, Peter writes this, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, that, so that he might bring us to God, having put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So when we come to Jesus Christ, we're put, in, we're put to death in the flesh, but we're made alive in the spirit. Now, what is death? 
Uh, I should ask Pastor Scott. He sees this. He deals with this every week. Okay. Uh, most people say death is when you die and you're not there anymore. And you know, it's kind of a lot of people think you just cease to exist. But that's not really what death is. Death is really separation. Okay. So physical death is separation of our body and our spirit, or our body and our soul. So the the spirit returns to God, uh, and the body stays here, and we call that physical death. Spiritual death is when we're separated from God. And so we're, we're, the separation there is God is in heaven. We're separated from God because we have spiritual death and that winds up where people go to hell because they're no longer able to be in God's company. So death is really separation. And so when he says here that having put to death in the flesh, it means we're se- we should be separate from the flesh. The word sanctified means set apart. We should be set apart from the flesh. We should no longer follow. We have, we're tempted to it. We can choose that. But we should not choose that, according to the scriptures. Um, there's a quote here I'd like to give from Lehman Strauss, and I, I've, I'll quote him maybe twice in this sermon. Uh, it's kind of um, unique for me, I guess nostalgic in a sense. One of my best friends pastors Calvary Baptist Church down in, uh, down in Bristol, and the former pastor there was Lehman Strauss. And in fact, he baptized my wife's uh, mother uh, years and years ago. He was a great Bible teacher. I heard him speak down at Sandy Cove Bible Conference a number of times, and I have a a number of his books. And uh, in fact, uh, some of the books were from my dad's library, and some were from mine, and some, and, uh, but I I took his books, and he was a great Bible teacher that day. And he says on this particular passage, he says, the Old Testament, the old nature has not been eradicated. We need to be aware of its assertion in our lives. Our liberty in Christ is freedom, this is, listen to this, our liberty in Christ is freedom to do right, not freedom to do what our old nature desires and dictates. Our liberty in Christ is freedom to do right, not freedom to do what our old desires, our old nature desires and dictates. In Romans 6 it says we're, f- we're not free to sin, but we're free from sin. We're no longer dead in sin, we are dead to sin. So we still have these things in our lives that are trying to tempt us, but the characteristic of the Christian is to oppose the flesh, to not do what the flesh wants us to do. Um, grace does not free us to sin. Today, in fact, uh, it was interesting that Pastor Scott mentioned the addictions, uh, the, uh, the drug awareness march, the addictions march, because so many people are addicted to so many things today. Pornography, uh, drugs, uh, cigarettes, um, uh, sex. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can list here that are addictions in our lives today. And yet, uh, there, it seems that the flesh wants to rule, and it's hard to get that out of our lives. Uh, the dissatisfaction abounds. That's part of the flesh. Dissatisfaction with life. We want, uh, it's the greener grass syndrome. You know, we want uh, bigger houses, more money, less bills. You know, we, we always seem to be able to complain about something because dissatisfaction is there. And yet, what did uh, Paul say? He said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Content. The flesh doesn't want us to be content. The flesh just wants us to desire more. Uh, one of the authors, uh, and I'm just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to work from his words. He spends a little bit of time on this section. What does it mean to oppose the flesh? And um, he, numbers, he has a number of things down here, and I thought it was good, so I'd like to just read part of it. His name is uh, Wilson, uh, Todd Wilson, in this book of Galatians. He says, we provide for opportunity for the flesh when we coddle an unforgiving spirit or harbor a grudge toward another person. When we fail to overlook minor offenses, uh, as in Proverbs 19.11, um, our flesh is so vain and proud, it is easily offended even by the slightest little thing. Uh, a third thing, we allow ourselves to put a negative spin on the actions of others. Um, but love's supposed to believe all things, but we put the negative spin on it. Uh, another thing he has here, we provide opportunity for the flesh when we indulge ourselves in speaking negatively about others. Uh, Ephesians 4 and 29 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, for only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Often we combat our evil thoughts most effectively if we absolutely refuse to allow them to be verbalized. Uh, where, um, where this discipline of the tongue is practiced right from the start, individuals will make an amazing discovery. They will be able to stop constantly keeping an eye on others, judging them, condemning them, and putting them in their place, and thus doing violence to them. 
Um, two more points he puts here. We, when, um, we um, give opportunity to the flesh when we engage in conversation with those who are negative and continue in conversation when the, uh, the conversation turns negative. Uh, gossip, critical speech, harsh words, insults, sarcasm, ridicule. We uh, need to avoid negative people. Even some believers are chronically negative. They consistently spew criticism or harsh words or sarcasm. Build them up in love, but as a rule, avoid going out to coffee with them. And then lastly, he says, we provide opportunity for the flesh when we deal um, with our personal grievances swiftly and when we fail to deal with our personal grievances swiftly and directly. We give not only the flesh, but the devil himself an opportunity to make inroads into our lives and into our communities. And he goes on with a few other things, but the flesh, it wants to come into our lives and it wants to turn us around. And if we don't resist it, we wind up going that direction. The second thing he talks about here is in the same verse. He says, not only do we turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but by through love, serve one another. So the second thing is to serve, in, to serve others in love. To serve others in love. Um, the word serve here is do loss, uh, and it is that of being a servant. Now, isn't it interesting? What did he say we should have in the first verse? We should have what? According to this weekend. Freedom, right. We should have freedom. And how should we have freedom? By serving. Isn't that an oxymoron? I mean, I thought we fought a civil war to get rid of slavery and servitude and that kind of thing. And yet serving is how we have freedom. Serving others in love. The word diaconus is the word servant. Deacons. Deacons are servants. Now, a lot of people and a lot of churches, and I think they put deacons in the wrong spot. They take deacons and think, de and think deacons run things, and they're kind of, they, they, you know, uh, they'll have a, a pastor, and they'll have a board of deacons, and they, and they try to choose deacons who are going to, um, you know, vote their way on stuff and kind of tilt the scale so that they get their That's not what deacons are. Deacons are servants. Now, in our church, our, our, our deacons are those that lead the various programs, who have charge of, say, are responsible for fellowship, to, uh, the fellowship or responsible for building the grounds or whatever. Those are deacon-level positions. What are deacons? They're servants. They're servant leaders. They serve, and they make sure their area is taken care of. Serving others in love. That's how we show a characteristic of a Christian, he says here to serve one another in love. It's the idea of the uh, upper room. Jesus Christ, they were having a great discussion. And let me just read some of that. Luke chapter 22, verses 24 to 27. There arose such a dispute among them as to which one of them was the, regarded to be the greatest. And Jesus said to them, the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest and the leader like the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? It is not the one who reclines at the table, but I among you as the one who serves. And then Jesus went on to wash their feet. You don't become great by being the guy that's at the head of the thing and being able to have everyone serve you. You become great by being a servant of others in love. Again, uh, Layman Strauss writes this. One may be very punctilious in observing ceremonial and ceremony and ritual, but not have the love of God in him. Calvin has said that none are more zealous and regular in observing ceremonies than hypocrites. In other words, doing the ceremony, making sure you do the right thing at the right time, you know, and so forth, that's easy. But serving others in love, that's hard. Being loving to people, especially who aren't loving, is difficult, who are being obstinate with you. In the church, it becomes, and it destroys many churches because they don't put these things to work. Jonathan Edwards once said, heaven is the final resting place where we will at last be free from the desires and works of the flesh forever and will therefore dwell with one another in perfect loving service, joy, and delight. Now, um, one of the things that could possibly be a good example of loving service is a mom. A mom loves her children, or loves her child. Uh, one of our ladies up here, I think she was singing this morning, wasn't, uh, yeah, Susan was singing, has a, a, a newborn baby. And when the baby has a dirty diaper, what does she do? Change the diaper. 
John, I'm not going to ask you how many dirty diapers you changed yet. You know, guys get to change diapers. But, you know, I can't understand it. You know, see, a, a baby is a dirty diaper, and a mom says, oh, let me change her. Uh, that's just an oxymoron. That's, that's not something you could jump in to do. I mean, why do you like to change a diaper, you know? But you know what? Moms love to do it for some reason. God's put that in them. I've had to change them, but that's not my favorite thing to do. <laughs> not my favorite thing to do. But that's what you call service in love. She loves that child, and she's going to serve that child. And she's going to be an example to us of what service is like in love. In, in um, 1 Peter 4, 8, it says, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Like the mom, we need to be willing to serve it. Does it mean that when we service someone else, when we're serving others, that we're going to, that's going to be a, 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 should I say, an enjoyable task? Is it always going to be something we like doing? Is it always going to be fun? No. But you know, our joy comes from serving someone else. And oftentimes when we serve, and I'm not just talking about the gift of helps here, okay? Helps is, helps is nice. Helps is when you want to help somebody else do something, and that's good. But serving, there's, there's a lot of ways of serving one another. Helps oftentimes is the physical, you know, I'm going to bake you a meal, or I'm going to help you, you know, fix your car, or whatever else it is. But serving other people is in many ways. It might be um, taking some time with the person and listening. There's all kinds of ways of serving people. And one of the characteristics of the Christian is to serve others in love. The third thing he says here is in verse 14, and it kind of is a follow-on to what uh, the point two is. It's to love your neighbor. And it says in verse 14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word in this statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I think that's kind of interesting. He's saying, don't follow the law, but love your neighbor, which helps you fulfill the law. I think what he's talking about here is this moral law, the overarching thing. You find this particular statement not in the, not in the Ten Commandments. You find in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. He says, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, for I am the Lord. Now, they got into a big argument about that in the New Testament, didn't they? Do you remember? And what parable did Jesus Christ give to illustrate who the person's neighbor was? It was the parable of the what? Thank you, the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan. The priest walked, came by, didn't help. Levi came by, didn't help. The Samaritan came by, who has no dealings with the Jews, and he helped. He said, who was the neighbor? The Samaritan, because he helped. Who was our neighbor? Our neighbor is anybody we contact, come in contact with who is in need. I think perhaps this verse goes a little bit further than the second verse or the second topic because the second topic is to serve others in love I think that's talking generally speaking but I think the point that Paul is making at this point is to serve others in the church fellow believers in love and then I think this one serve your neighbor I think that goes even beyond that I think it was beyond the church beyond believers it goes to serve and love your neighbor as yourself and that's hard to do how do you love your neighbors as yourself we can all take care of our, we, we would have a hard time admitting that we love ourselves, wouldn't we? You know? How many people say, I love myself? You know, not too many. Okay, very good. <laughs> you know what? And that's good because you know how to love your neighbor now, right? You know, we really do love ourselves. We try to avoid pain. How many people try to avoid pain? Why do you avoid pain? Because you love yourself, you know? You don't want to go through pain. Well, the, then the, the principle is then, if you don't want to go through pain because you love yourself that much, then you don't want your fellow, your neighbor to go through pain. And so you're going to help them not go through pain. What are you doing in order to love your neighbor? When I was in eighth grade, we, had to, uh, we, we sang songs because our town, the eighth grade was the last class we went to in our hometown before we went to the regional high school, which was in the next town. And so they had a big graduation and everything, and we did a ceremony, and, and we sat with, in a music class, we had to learn to sing all these songs, and every single one had the theme of love that year, you know? Love makes the world go round, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, what the world need now is love, sweet love, you know? Um, all about love, because love is important even to the unbeliever. 
Even to the person that was leading that class, love was important. In Matthew 22, 36 to 40, Jesus Christ says, you shall love, there are two commandments that are important. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and so forth, and love your neighbor as yourself. And that's really the whole law. If you look at the, if you look at the Ten Commandments, the first of the Ten Commandments, the first part of them deals with loving God. The second part of them deals with loving your neighbor. You know, don't lie, don't covet, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. It, it all relates to your neighbor. Are we loving our neighbor as ourselves? And then lastly, we come to the verse 15. and says, but if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. That suggests to me that the Judaizers were creating some severe arguments in the, within the church. They were really going at it. They were, I, and I think they were probably doing exactly what it says, biting and devouring one another. They were getting angry at each other, probably calling each other names. They, this had become a severe disagreement within the church. And it disturbed the Apostle Paul. And it says, watch it. Because if you bite and devour one another, what does this say? Let's take care lest you be consumed by one another. You'll eat each other up. Eventually there'll be no more church. And Satan would love that. He would love for the flesh to take over our lives. He would love us to not serve one another. He would love it for us to consume one another and to follow what he says here in this fourth section. But he says, avoid harming one another. Nobody wins, everybody loses. There are a couple of quotes from a couple of books I want to read here just briefly again. Strauss, he says, it is sad to hear of Christians snapping, snapping and snarling at one another. Snapping and snarling at one another. Harry A. Ironside, anybody hear of him before? Okay, it's one, one of the great old guys. I've got, the, I've got three books that I'm using a little bit. They, they're not real detailed in this particular series, but uh, these guys have been around for ages, and, I, and these are some names that have just been in history for forever, and uh, a great, were great men of God. Uh, Ironside, I'm referring to Romans chapter 12, verses one and two, if you remember. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service of, of worship, okay? Um, he, he says this, a number of Christians have presented almost every part of their bodies to God except their tongues. They have kept the tongue for themselves and they allow them to wag on and on until gradually they bring, it, it bring in a lot of sorrow and grief among the people of God. And if you want to read it, I could. When we have a, a few minutes, we may take a brief look at that. Um, he, James James has so much to say about the tongue. And the tongue is what gets into trouble so many times. We say things we don't mean. We say things that hurt other people. And then we get back and forth. Or we, or we, or we, try, to, we try to say something. I'm sure this is what's happening with these Judaizers and these, and these uh, uh, Galatians. The Judaizers were saying things and they were, that were not really, they, they really shouldn't be saying. And there was a great disharmony there. To the point that they were going to consume each other. And then the third one is, uh, this is uh, William Pennegill. He was one of my father's professors back at Philadelphia School of the Bible years and years ago. He said, whichever side wins, they both lose. Think of that. Whichever side wins, they both lose. Isn't that true in an argument? You get an argument and, you know, there might be one side that wins, but really both sides wind up losing. They wind up losing respect. They wind up losing friendship. Uh, friendship has been destroyed with people because of words going back and forth. And then McKnight says this, the problem of the Galatians is typically human. Egos enter into the debates between people and before long, the issue is who is going to win. It becomes who is right, not what is right. It becomes who is right, not what is right. Romans 15, six and seven says that with one accord, May you, with one voice, glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Let's take just a few moments and look at James, as, as Harry Ironside suggests. James chapter 1, verse 19 and, 5, and 26. James chapter 1, verses 19 and 26. Here's a section where James talks a great deal about the tongue. And it's, it's something that is happening here. The Judaizers are using their tongues to accuse each other. 
and to create dissension in the church. He says in verse 19, this you know, my beloved brethren, let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And then verse 26, he, he, uh, 26, he brings up this again. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. And then if you turn over into chapter three, and I'm, I'm not gonna read this whole section, but if you wanna look at a little bit of what was creating more, what was creating problems with the Galatians, you can read chapter three, verses one, the whole chapter actually, one through 12 especially. And he talks about the tongue. He says, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. And then he goes on and gives a couple of illustrations. He gives illustrations of horses uh, with bridles in the mouth. He gives an uh, 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 illustration of ships with a rudder. He gives the illustration of fire, which burns up things, and fire destroys fire. And, and that can be one of the great illustrations that he's talking about here when he says that, um, lest you be consumed by one another. If you start a fire, and there's a lot of fires going off on the West Coast, how do they fight fire? They throw water on it sometimes, but how's another time, they, uh, how else do they fire? With fire, yeah. They start what they call a controlled burn. They, the fire's coming this way. They start a controlled burn here and burn up a bunkage of acreage so that when the other fire gets here, it cannot keep on going because everything's already been burned up. And the two fires come together and it goes out because there's nothing more to burn. And that's what happens in the church or in the home or in the workplace or any place else when we wind up taking this kind of opposition with words and so forth and fire burns fire and what happens? Does anybody win? No. The whole thing consumes each other. This morning as we close the, the theme that I want to share with you is true freedom is serving others in love. True freedom is serving others in love. I want to close by reading from the book of Philippians four verses as we close because this is really what he's sharing when he says serve one another, when he says uh, don't harm one another, and it comes from Philippians. And just take a few seconds and listen to this. It's, it's a section about um, putting Christ first. It says this, therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion make my joy complete by being of the same mind maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Whether in the church, whether in the home, whether in the workplace, these are principles we can use. Don't be like the Judaizers who are trying to cause division in, in that church and are trying to get them to um, retreat into the old way of life. Don't allow the flesh to take over. Don't retreat back to the old, but allow the, the grace of God to give you freedom. Not freedom to do anything, but the freedom to serve others in love as God wants us to. Dear Lord, as we thank you, as we come before you this, this, today and we, we share the communion table, we ask that you might help us to reflect on our own lives, to look at what we've done in our lives and how we are operating and, and how we operate in the future. We pray that if there's uh, areas in our lives where we need to uh, improve, that you'll help us to just meditate on those today and be willing to do that. As we come to this table, we remember that the freedom we got was not free. And I'm not talking about our national freedom. I'm speaking about our freedom in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ paid the penalty on the cross. And today, as we partake of the cup and of the bread, we remind ourselves of the great sacrifice that you made on our behalf and how you served others, not just when you washed the feet, but as you gave your life for us. May we have the same feeling towards others as we serve them. In Jesus' name, amen.